Okay, we all set. Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you all to the July uh, session of the 2016 webinar series. Um, today, Matt Russell, Assistant Professor at the Department of Forest Resources and Extension Specialist, along with Matt Glasby, a grad student in Natural Resources Science and Management, are going to be uh, giving us a presentation on forest disturbances in Minnesota, what impacts us most. Um, they're going to get started in a second. Before I sign off, though, I'm going to let you know that we're going to be getting back together again in August. And Bill Anderson is going to be giving a webinar um, to discuss the natural resources applications of using drones. So we hope to see you then on August 16th. Matt? Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us either online or uh, some of us here in St. Paul. Uh, the focus today is really on, on forest disturbances uh, in Minnesota and really getting the sense of, you know, how do we quantify forest disturbances uh, and what are the most important ones that impact uh, the structure and function of our forests uh, in Minnesota. So I'd like to uh, just mention some brief acknowledgments uh, for some folks that I um, had some discussions with in my, in my years here at, at Minnesota, uh, Brian Schwindel in particular, uh, in help in interpreting the forest health information. Uh, that the DNR collects, uh, and also Doug Tilma, who um, has provided some insight into uh, the timber cell data that we might be able to use uh, for understanding some of these trends in forest disturbances. Then, of course, uh, field crews, technicians, specialists, scientists that work for DNR uh, and the Forest Service are really the ones that make um, uh, some of the data sets that I'll talk about today um, happen. Uh, that is, they are, they are the ones that are out in the field collecting the data, interpreting the data, uh, and then sharing the data uh, with their stakeholders. And so a bit of a roadmap uh, for the next hour. Uh, I'll discuss some primary disturbances in Minnesota forests, uh, what they mean uh, for our forest management, uh, for Minnesota's forest landscape, uh, and then really get a sense on and particularly where Mac will take over uh, is to tell us, you know, how do these forest disturbances impact uh, forest composition um, across the state? And then in doing this, uh, we really rely on a lot of monitoring data, um, forest health inventory information to do this. So I'll chat a little bit about that. Um, and then just to get a sense overall about the impacts of disturbances um, across our landscape. And so if you only wanted to come to the webinar to learn what impacts us most when it comes to forest disturbances, uh, here's the answer, uh, or at least one of the answers. Uh, and we'll talk about why this is just one of the answers a little later on. We can use data from uh, tools like the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program uh, to get a sense of how much impact uh, disturbances have in Minnesota. And so if you look at the data from Minnesota uh, for the last five years, or at least 2010 to 2014, uh, animal damage and weather damage are each just about around uh, 600,000 acres um, impacted across that five year span. Uh, and that's followed by human disturbances, uh, and then diseases, fire, uh, insects, and other agents uh, tend to be impacting less than 200,000 acres of forest in Minnesota um, across this last five year time span. Um, and so this is a, a program, and, and we'll talk more about the FIA data um, and how we can use it to understand disturbances, but it seems that um, in Minnesota's landscape, uh, this animal damage and weather damage are two of the agents that are causing at least the most in terms of total acreage affected um, by these disturbance types. Uh, so what do we talk about when we say disturbance? Uh, so we use this term uh, pretty regularly, um, but uh, it's really important, I think, to, to take a look at what the SAF uh, Dictionary of Forestry defines it as. So this is a relatively discrete event in time that disrupts ecosystem community or population structure uh, and changes the resources, uh, substrate availability, or the physical environment. And so this is a picture of the recent uh, windstorm that happened in the St. Croix area, uh, the St. Croix State Forest, uh, St. Croix State Park, where uh, each affected uh, a large windstorm that are, that are quite common in Minnesota's landscape. And I want to go back to this definition and really look at it. And a few things that pop out to me are disturbance, a relatively discrete event. And so a windstorm like this is certainly a discrete event, likely happens over a couple of hour time span. Um, but we can compare that to something like uh, spruce budworm defoliation. So spruce budworm in Minnesota tends to stay in an area for uh, several years. 
And so when you look at the, the length of, um, say, a rotation of that forest, um, it might be a much longer time span, but maybe consider that a discrete event over that few years uh, where budworm is impacting the forest. Uh, so it's important to understand sort of the temporal dynamics and how long these disturbance agents occur for uh, based on where they, um, where they happen and, and how they influence our forests. And of course, we've, uh, these forest health trends, uh, disturbance trends, have been in the popular media, uh, in the field of science, uh, really focusing on forest health. Uh, and a white-tailed deer was on the cover of Time magazine uh, as recently as just a few years ago. So uh, people are understanding that these disturbances that we're seeing in our forest are really important, have big implications um, for our forests and, and the ecosystem services that they provide. Of course, in Minnesota, uh, we are um, we have a lot of history of, of these really large scale, very broad events um, that have happened. Uh, think back to the, the Great Hinkley Fire in 1894, uh, the Cloquet Moose Fire, uh, Moose Lake Fire uh, in 1918, uh, almost 900 deaths across 600,000 acres of forest. And so here's a picture of uh, what downtown Hinkley looked like uh, the morning after the fire. Uh, and so obviously, the reason of this uh, was because of you know, a lot of the logging that we did. Um, a lot of the land management that we did at the turn of the century uh, and these large scale fires kind of resulted from that. But guess what? Our forests recovered pretty well. Um, and so this is a picture of, uh, or a graph I should say, of forest inventory analysis data. Uh, and this data goes back um, all the way to 1934, where kind of uh, folks here in the Department of Forest Resources uh, have found that data and are beginning to analyze it. Uh, what we've done is um, taken a look at um, the total tree volume in 1934 and compared that to uh, the volume of trees that we're seeing today, or at least in, in 2013. And for most of the forest types that were um, kind of in that post uh, fire that, that really heavily disturbed landscape following a lot of those big fires in Minnesota, uh, most of them recovered pretty well. Uh, so just about 7 billion cubic feet of wood uh, on the ground in 1934 and that uh, post-disturbed landscape, uh, we've got uh, twice that now, almost uh, 16 billion uh, cubic foot of wood. So uh, even in just a span of about 100 years, uh, we can see that our forests can respond uh, to these uh, disturbances, uh, at least by, by, by growing uh, and kind of reoccupying that uh, disturbed landscape. And of course, today we're very concerned with um, forest disturbances and what that means for uh, sequestering carbon. Uh, so on average, about our, our forest sequester, or they take in about 16% of all the emissions that we put out from driving our cars and uh, running our power plants um, every year. And so the concern where forest disturbances fit in um, is if we have large scale events like forest fires and uh, insect outbreaks, um, and beetle damage that's, that's occurring in our forests. Well, those are killing trees immediately. Those are basically a net emissions um, kind of going into, uh, into the atmosphere. And so the ability for our trees, um, if there are no forests there, obviously we can't soak up that, uh, that carbon uh, to capture in tree growth, uh, which is good for uh, kind of mitigating our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so this plays a role in, in terms of things that we're thinking about now on a much global level. Uh, when it comes to disturbances like forest fires, defoliation outbreaks uh, that ultimately uh, impact our landscapes. And so I'll, I'll chat a little bit about um, kind of the primary forest disturbance agents that we're seeing. Um, these are things that, that we all know of and maybe that we're managing in the woods, but uh, things like weather, fire, animals, insects, diseases, uh, and humans can all have a large role uh, in changing the composition and the structure of our forests. This is a figure of, um, when we talk about disturbance agents, we think about, uh, well, they might be human caused or they might be related more naturally uh, to natural events that occur. And so this, uh, this publication attempted to kind of try to uh, put a scale on, you know, whether or not a certain disturbance is natural um, or human. Um, as an example, deforestation, global atmospheric change may be largely a uh, human related uh, disturbance agent. Whereas, when compared to things like windstorms, hurricanes, ice storms, well, those might be more purely uh, naturally occurring disturbances uh, that are part of our landscape. And then we have this mix of maybe a few different things introduced species and fire, 
well, maybe that can span the, uh, the spectrum from being both either naturally caused or human caused, or maybe a mix of both kinds of disturbance agents. Weather damage, uh, Minnesota, we, uh, these uh, large scale windstorms, uh, the ratios that uh, whip across our landscape are, uh, are common. Uh, so most recent ones are boundary water flow down of uh, about 450,000 acres. The St. Croix Valley windstorm, a uh, picture I showed uh, earlier, affected about 160,000 acres. And then we can think about weather damage as influencing other agents um, or other forest health issues. And so things like um, drought that may happen uh, over several years might help to contribute to something like aspen decline. Uh, maybe this might be a reason uh, why just not alone weather isn't impacting something, but maybe in combination uh, with some other factors, uh, weather might be playing a role um, to, uh, to disturbing our forest, to, uh, leading to forest health issues that we might need to address. Of course, fire across the U.S. Um, is, a, is a common thing, uh, more or less common, depending on what uh, forest type or, or what grassland ecosystem you're, you're found in. But at least in Minnesota, we're finding that um, a, a lot of our fires and their uh, return intervals, some stand replacement fires as, as low as every 30 years, um, other kind of mixed severity fires up to about 500 years. Uh, and so those of you that are familiar with the Native Plant Community Guide and, and that classification system uh, can turn to um, kind of some of the disturbance histories uh, that are found within an individual uh, Native Plant Community. Of course, we're very interested in, in wildfires um, and what they mean for, uh, for Minnesota. Uh, wildfires are, are quite common. Uh, we have, uh, this is data uh, this graph depicts data uh, in which the DNR responded to fires, uh, or was the primary agency uh, that responded to a wildfire. Uh, and so this is primarily on state and rural private lands, but but excludes uh, federal and tribal lands uh, across Minnesota. And so on average, you can see uh, there's about 1,500 fires that DNR responds to annually, uh, and this is kind of the distribution. So we have lots of fires, but most of them are fairly small in size. Um, and so this is just a histogram of the, the total size of the fire by uh, how many fires are observed in this database um, that's available online. And so they range in, in, in size from you know less than a less than an acre to over 28,000 acres. On um, the average is depending on whether you look at the median or the or the mean. Uh, the median is about one acre. Most of them are small. Uh, the mean, the average is about 27 acres if you take into account. Uh, those much larger fires uh, that occur across our landscape. Of course, folks are very interested in understanding not just one disturbance, but this idea of multiple disturbances that might occur um, across, across the landscape. Uh, one analysis uh, that was conducted after the boundary waters blow down um, by, by scientists um, at the U.S. Forest Service uh, was to take a look at um, how much uh, deadwood was, was a result of that of that blowdown, uh, and kind of separate those into what we call you know forest fuel classes, or kind of put that deadwood in the context of, of fire risk. Um, and so they're finding basically that those blowdown areas a lot more deadwood compared to non-blowdown areas, and compared to the Laurentian mixed forest province average, that 212 uh, ecosystem. And then again, we can take a look at um, this work from John Bradford and, and his colleagues um, taking a look at, um, depending on what, what kind of multiple disturbances are interested, ranging from a control, maybe a can, a forest that was not affected by any disturbance, uh, to blow down, fire, and then blow down plus fire, and then blow down plus salvage logging uh, plus fire. Just to show you that um, these different disturbance agents, followed by how we respond as, as managers, particularly in the case of salvage logging, uh, can lead to different. Uh, biomass or a different carbon or just a different forced uh, structure that, that's out there. Uh, I mentioned animal damage is uh, one of the primary disturbance agents in our forests. Um, and we can look to you know some long-term research uh, that provides evidence of, of some of this animal damage. Uh, and so as an exa example, uh, Mark White uh, has worked with the Nature Conservancy um, has monitored this um, a deer exposure study 
uh, in Lake County um, since about 1998. And sure enough, uh, like many of us have been able to see with these exposure studies, uh, the fenced areas uh, that, that are free of, of browse impact uh, tend to have uh, at least a higher density of, of individual trees uh, for these trees in these smaller diameter classes, that is seedlings and saplings. And so just to go to show you the, the importance of understanding deer uh, and browse as a, as a disturbance agent in our forest. Of course, we deal with other animal disturbances as well. Um, things like beaver uh, can do flooding, can cut down trees, uh, can really lead to, to some management issues that we need to address. Uh, porcupines, yeah, a, a big problem. Uh, things like bear, uh, rabbits, and rabbit brows, and, and things like that. And then also domestic animals and livestock. Um, so things like silvo pastures are very common in Minnesota. Uh, that is, where we're trying to grow trees, and we're also trying to grow livestock at the same time. Um, so you can think of uh, if trying to do any regeneration in, in a stand, in a civil pasture, uh, then you might have challenges or uh, at least find ways to adjust them. Of course, this little uh, bug is uh, the eastern larch beetle. Uh, we had a great webinar um, in the spring uh, by Brian Rothman about the, about the eastern larch beetle. Uh, but this is a, a very big disturbance agent uh, in Minnesota's forests in the northwestern part of the state. And some data from uh, Brian Schwingle, uh, the Minnesota DNR, uh, and some of the forest health surveys that they've done. This is about uh, 240,000 acres of Minnesota's forest that have been impacted by this beetle. Um, and you can see the kind of trend since we first observed it in about 2001. So it colonizes the phloem of terabat, terabat, tamarack, I'm sorry. Uh, the outbreaks are really uh, pretty local uh, and of a short duration, at least historically. Um, and so how does this, why is this insect doing so much damage? Well, there's been some, uh, some research that uh, Brian Ockman and his, his lab have done that, that tend to kind of relate this to uh, warming um, as the primary suspect and uh, what's bringing about this native beetle that's doing so much damage uh, across our forests. Of course, uh, we're always concerned about native forest pests, but uh, the number of non-native forest pests um, is quite high here in Minnesota. Uh, average about um, 20 uh, forest pests um, that are found in Minnesota um, are a significant concern for um, trying to undergo forest management um, kind of without these things. So uh, just to show you that um, these non-native forest pests are a concern. We're in a, near a big shipping port like Duluth, and as things come over to us, uh, we need to find ways to manage these things um, and to lessen and mitigate their impacts uh, on our forests. Emerald Ash Borer, again, another great webinar we had um, a few months ago um, with some folks from Michigan and, and Minnesota uh, talking about the impacts that EAB might have. Um, obviously, discovered in Detroit in uh, 2002, all ash trees are successful susceptible. And so in some of our black ash swamps uh, in Minnesota, where we have about a million acres or one billion trees, uh, this is a really important um, insect to, to keep on our radar. Um, and then obviously, yeah, Minnesota has the highest volume of ash in any U.S. state um, across um, about a million acres or about one billion trees um, in Minnesota. So I always have to um, keep finding a new map um, of EAB and, and where it is because it's, it's spreading. Uh, so I know most recently they found it uh, in Texas uh, and also in Colorado. So uh, from Detroit, Michigan, it's kind of spread east, it's spread south, it's spread west. Um, and so this is kind of um, a snapshot of where um, where it is across the U.S. And Minnesota, I think there are 10 counties now, uh, that have confirmed EAB uh, in their county. Of course, there are other um, diseases that don't necessarily have you know, big impacts, think of a forest fire or a blowdown event, um, but also some diseases that are, that are present in our forest. So things like R malaria. Um, so R malaria can host broadleaf and conifer trees, um, can form mycelial fans, or what they call shoestrings near the roots, uh, pathogens, these, these favor trees under stress. Um, fungus kills cambium, decays the xylem tissue. Um, and a way to manage this is just to try to manage healthy trees and try to avoid stress. So 
uh, kind of a more lower impact disturbance, one that we don't always know is there, but one that we know is uh, very abundant across the landscape in Minnesota. And then um, oak wilt, uh, another tree disease that we're very concerned with. Um, so the map here on the right shows uh, all the confirmed oak wilt uh, locations across the state. Um, this tend to be, at least from the last year's forest health report uh, from the DNR, it tends to be uh, moving north well into Pine County now um, as, we're, um, as we're monitoring the, the spread of oak wilt throughout the state. Uh, this picture on the lower right shows a, a healthy bur oak uh, in the middle of a oak pot, oak wilt um, pocket. Um, and so just to show you the differences in uh, tolerances for oak wilt agents, um, depending on the species of, of the tree. Uh, and then humans uh, can also be obviously uh, a big and, and important um, disturbance agent. Uh, now we could be um, kind of trying to emulate some kind of natural disturbance. Maybe that's through a, a prescribed fire or some kind of um, silviculture or management that we're doing. Or we could be doing things that well maybe don't really have any management behind them. Uh, so this is a, a picture of a, a spoked pattern that um, a landowner in St. Louis County uh, cut up um, because it was a good deer hunting. And so if he had his, his or her tree stand in the middle of that uh, spoked pattern, then all the deer would naturally just kind of feed into him. So definitely it's something that's disturbing our landscape. That's a, a wide area if you add up all those uh, spokes uh, that have been cut out of, uh, cut out of the forest. Um, and so one that, that's a disturbance that you know, might not have any management behind it. And other things, um, human disturbances that might seem good kind of independent of themselves, but uh, could contribute to other forest health issues. So I'm thinking of, um, say, pruning oak trees in a high oak risk period may be okay for the tree, but if you recognize that um, there are disadvantages of doing that with um, other um, other forest health things going on, um, then, then we need to be concerned about that in terms of uh, how humans are impacting the landscape. So I want to hand it over now to uh, Mac Glasby. He's going to talk about um, how we can use the forest inventory analysis program uh, to understand some disturbance trends that we're seeing in the forest. Thanks, everybody. Uh, today, I will quickly share with you some of the results I found in my thesis research using FIA inventory data and disturbance data to analyze the impacts of disturbance across the Lake States region. So the data that I used was annual inventory data from the FIA program recorded between 1999 and 2014. The FIA program is a National Forest Inventory with a rotating panel design where they remeasure plots about every five years and about one plot for every 6,000 acres of forest land. There's three phases of data collection. The first one is just remote sensing to identify forest land from non-forest land. The second phase is the on-the-ground measurements of tree and plot conditions. And the third phase is forest health measurements. All of the data used in this study was from the second phase. So this is the FIA plot design. Um, it sort of goes in this hierarchy of the, the plot level measurements down to the condition level measurements and then down to the tree level measurements. Um, in this study, I used only single condition plots. So the plot and the condition level are the same thing. And the plot consists of these four subplots, which total about a sixth of an acre. A plot can have multiple conditions too, which means that it's two different forest types or regeneration statuses, et cetera, two things on the same plot that are not the same. So for all plot records uh, between 1999 and 2014, I tallied up the, the disturbance records and found that animal and weather were the most common disturbances across the region, which is consistent with Matt's findings, and that human disturbance was the next most common and human disturbance is defined as any disturbance caused by humans other than silviculture and timber harvesting. Um, and disturbance is defined as an area of one acre or larger in which 25% of the trees are damaged or dead. And that's the FIA definitions. So as you can see, fire is not very common across the region. Um, 
disease and insect are moderately common, but really it's animal and weather that make up over half of our disturbance records from the past 15 years. And then this is um, just a table of the seven most common forest types and the percentage of plots that were disturbed and not disturbed. And it's interesting that aspen birch and maple beech birch were the two most common forest type groups in the region and their percentage of disturbance records mimics the forest wide percentage. And then kind of the outliers here, elm ash, cottonwood, about 10% of those plots had a disturbance record and red, white, jack pine, only about 3% of those plots had a disturbance record. These are some maps I made showing the, the plot locations for these various disturbance agents. Um, in orange is disease, and you can, you can see that the Upper Peninsula sort of has a pulse of, of disease um, in the eastern half. And then Wisconsin has pretty uniform disease throughout the entire state, and Minnesota and Michigan are relatively disease-free. Um, in the black is insect disease. Again, a pulse in Upper Michigan of disease or of insect, and this time's in the western half. Michigan, Lower Michigan has insect all over the place, probably emerald ash borer. Minnesota and Wisconsin relatively insect free other than Minnesota has sort of this pulse in the northern part of the state that could be uh, eastern large beetle. Fire and weather maps. Um, in red is fire. Really not too much fire going on in the region, sort of what, what you would expect. Most of it located in northern Minnesota. And then weather, very common throughout the entire region with high concentrations along the north shore of Lake Superior and Arrowhead region of Minnesota, and then sort of over in this area where the St. Croix forests are. Animal and human. Animal, very, very common throughout the entire region. Um, north central Minnesota has a lot of animal disturbance. Uh, the driftless region of Wisconsin has a lot of animal disturbance, and the southern part of upper Michigan also has quite a bit of animal disturbance. And then human disturbance, pretty, pretty uniform across the region with a uh, high concentration in north central Minnesota. This is accounts of multiple disturbances. Uh, on the, the left is plot records and tallied by number of disturbance records at a given point in time. And as you can see, most, most plots with a disturbance only have one disturbance record and very few have more than one disturbance occurring at, at the same time. And when, it, and when there was multiple disturbances occurring at the same time, it was usually animal and animal or animal and weather which makes sense because those were the most common disturbances in the region. On the right is number of disturbances for, for a given plot over time. And here you see about 11.5% of all the plots in the region experienced some sort of disturbance over this 15 year window where they were measured two to three times. Um, but most of them only had one disturbance over this 15 year period. Here's a um, change in live basal area by disturbance agent and just kind of as a baseline, non-disturbed plots averaged about 70 square feet of live basal area per, per acre. So really what this is saying is other than human, on average, these disturbance events aren't super severe. And it's good to point out that animal disturbance was really the only disturbance agent that had an increase in live basal area over time and that's likely because animal disturbance isn't affecting trees over five inches which were which is what was used for this study only the trees over five inches and here is change in standing dead basal area so a little different story here the average non-disturbed plot had about 10 square feet of standing dead basal area in trees larger than five inches and really what we're seeing here is that fire and insect um, contribute to the largest increases in standing dead basal area on disturbed plots. And human disturbance is really the only disturbance that you see a reduction in standing dead basal area. And really in these non-disturbed plots, standing dead basal area isn't changing too much. 
that's all I have. I will hand things back over to Matt to wrap up this week's webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Mac. And before we move on, are there any questions from online? Not in my chat window, but I can see. Okay. Great. Well, we'll continue on. Again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to enter them uh, into the chat box. Um, so I want to talk about a different data set that we might use uh, for forest health um, and monitoring disturbances um, across Minnesota. And so many of you might be familiar with the aerial forest health survey data. Uh, that are collected in Minnesota and uh, many other states as well. Um, this has primarily been uh, DNR's uh, tool to understand what trends are in forest health across the state. And the valuable things about this data set are that it's been collected uh, really in, in a very similar fashion since the 1950s, although uh, specific things have changed over those years. Uh, it's really a collaborative effort. Um, and so uh, the Minnesota DNR forest health team and resource assessment uh, collaborates with the U.S. Forest Service, uh, state and private forestry, uh, to do these aerial surveys uh, from the from the sky. Uh, so the surveys are trained, uh, the ground checks are performed uh, to kind of get uh, to make sure that the baseline information that they're collecting uh, have good data quality uh, associated with them. So I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the differences between um, the aerial forest health surveys and the Minnesota FIA data that uh, Mac talked about. Um, the difference is in terms of the scale of measurement, well, aerial forest health surveys uh, are primarily obtained from uh, riding planes and you know, these one to three mile flight lines and uh, monitoring and, and, and sketching what, what you see beneath in terms of uh, forest disturbances and forest health threats. In the Minnesota FIA data, uh, as Mac mentioned, there's about one inventory plot on the ground every 6,000 forest acres. So uh, some differences in the scale of measurement are right there between the two programs. The data collection uh, for the aerial survey are collected annually, uh, whereas in the Minnesota FIA uh, program, it's about every five, and now we're getting higher to every seven years where we're going out uh, and remeasuring these plots um, that are in Minnesota. The data for the Forest Health Survey collected since the 1950s in Minnesota, uh, the best data are really from 1999. Uh, onward, there are some periodic data, um, um, although the disturbance information uh, obtained in uh, some periodic inventories that we did in the FIA program are, are limited, uh, at least here in Minnesota. Uh, in terms of the agent of disturbance, the good, the valuable thing about the Forest Health Survey is it identifies uh, to the species level, for the most part, uh, some of these pests that, that we're seeing. Uh, whereas with the in Minnesota FIA data, what we're only getting what we're really only getting is a broad disturbance class, so something like insect damage. And so the field crews in FIA are not necessarily trained forest health specialists, but they can identify insect damage, but um, not necessarily what specific species is causing that damage. Uh, so a very big, uh, I think, the, the separation between those two uh, forest health monitoring data sets. Comparing across states is really not recommended with aerial forest health survey information. Uh, different states collect data in different ways. Uh, Missouri uses a satellite uh, program to monitor defoliation, uh, whereas Minnesota uses uh, primarily uh, these flight lines to collect that information. Um, and so although all this forest health survey data uh, from the sky is submitted to the, uh, to the Forest Service every year, making those comparisons between Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and any other state uh, really is not recommended uh, for that data set. Um, the value in the FIA data is that, is that it is collected in the same fashion. Um, that is, it's very consistent across field measurements, what gets cataloged as a disturbance or not a disturbance. The issue of double counting in aerial forest salt surveys can be high, um, and that's just due to the standards that they use and really that annual design uh, that's a part of the aerial program. Uh, the double counting in Minnesota FIA program is minimized because it's just a longer time period between inventories. Um, so the fact that you might see that the same disturbance um, that happened 10 years ago in the inventory today is just uh, that much more or less uh, compared to if you were to go out and measure something every year. And so what I'm showing here is um, uh, these blue bars are exactly what I showed you in uh, one of the first slides of the table um, of the presentation uh, that showed the damage agent by disturbance uh, using FIA data. What the orange bars are, are the same 
kinds of disturbance agents, uh, but collected uh, and kind of interpreted from uh, summary tables in the uh, Minnesota DNR Forest Health Annual reports. And so what you can see here is really the, the need not to really kind of compare apples and apples with these two data sets. Uh, they're very different in terms of uh, their design. And so what we're seeing here is insect damage. Uh, if we were to look at the uh, last five years, um, it's quite high compared to at least what we're seeing on the ground uh, from FIA. And that just goes into the, uh, the issues of, of double counting and some of the other uh, issues with defoliation versus mortality um, with, with some of that aerial survey data. Um, that's collected um, um, by, by those partners. But we see that there's a really large agreement between you know, how much weather damage we have in our forests. Um, I believe it's just shy of about 600,000 acres over the past five years, uh, getting about the same number for, um, uh, for the FIA data and also for the uh, DNR aerial survey data. And so this idea of you know, how well do these monitoring programs do to identify these uh, things that are going on in these forest health agents uh, has really been studied uh, quite a bit. So um, Fred Baker is a retired faculty now um, from Utah State University, uh, but he was very interested in, in kind of asking that question, how well do monitoring programs identify something that's kind of hard to see uh, from both the sky and from the ground? Uh, and so he used, his example was dwarf mistletoe, which is uh, quite common uh, in the northwestern part of the state here in Minnesota. And so what he did was identified stands that were surveyed by both uh, the FIA program and the ground survey collected by uh, Minnesota DNR. And um, what they found, the FIA program and the DNR survey was just about 10 or 11 percent of the stands that they visited um, were recorded as having dwarf mistletoe. Now when, uh, uh, when Fred Baker and his colleagues went out, they actually found that number to be quite a bit higher. Um, and why is that? Well, um, they're you know, certainly trained forest health specialists. Dwarf mistletoe is a very hard thing to see um, in the woods, very hard to identify, um, and especially in this kind of uh, low, um, low endemic condition where it might kind of always be there. And so the idea that um, you know, we can use these forest health surveys to understand each little thing that's going on in our woods, we might have to use some caution with using this data and realize that, um, that there might be you know, really identifying some of these things really takes trained specialists um, to interpret them and analyze them. I want to switch a little bit and talk kind of maybe a little bit more broadly about, you know, we certainly know um, a lot of the ecological impacts of forest disturbances in terms of um, problems with regeneration, uh, losses and biodiversity and uh, some of our ecosystem services. But there's also a large economic impact um, of forest disturbances in the U.S. Uh, and in this paper, I tried to kind of uh, put a number on that uh, by summarizing various uh, disturbances uh, that are common across the United States. And they found insects and pathogens alone cost, um, uh, cost the U.S. about $1.5 billion um, annually um, every year. And so some others, landslides, obviously not a, a major problem here in, uh, in Minnesota, but in other states uh, it is. A lot of weather damages, things like hurricane, fire, and tornadoes. And just in the hundreds of million dollars, the economic impacts um, that these disturbances can have. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit kind of about uh, this disturbance and maybe getting at some of those economic impacts um, from a case study here in Minnesota. Uh, so again, uh, turning back to that St. Croix windstorm that happened in uh, 2011, um, really a, a one day event that um, left a tremendous amount of wood on the ground uh, and folks didn't know what to do um, to clean it up. And as it turned out, the state government was shut down uh, during the time that this windstorm happened. So. A very big thing to deal with on, on state lands um, around the sandstone area of Minnesota. And so we can look at things like the DNR timber sale records to uh, get a sense of well, what happened to that wood after it blew down. How did how did agencies respond to, to getting that wood and trying to uh, do do new management opportunities? And so uh, if we look at just a couple of uh, just about the year after the St. Croix windstorm. There's almost 200,000 cords of wood sold just from the sandstone office, uh, which was mostly um, salvage wood uh, from those that big windstorm that occurred. And so we can kind of use timber sale records, kind of know something about the general composition of the forest in the St. Croix area, uh, 
uh, to get at the economic impacts of, of salvage harvesting um, across the state. And when we look at uh, well, how, what big, how big of a role does salvage harvesting play in you know contributing to helping to promote um, kind of forest ecosystem recovery, um, and also trying to kind of get some value for some of that wood that um, is on the ground. We've been looking at some of the data from both Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, and as it turns out, there's about 800,000 cords of salvage wood uh, over the last five years um, from from these two states. And so you can see the, the big dots there are, are how many cords of wood were sold, uh, depending on location. And right there, the hot spot is the St. Croix area. Uh, that, happened in, um, that happened in 2011. We also see in Minnesota lots of salvage wood from uh, DNR offices located in the uh, kind of more northwestern part of the state. Um, suspect that potentially could be eastern large beetle uh, wood uh, that's trying to be marketed and sold to the mills. And so we can use. Um, Something like um, uh, timber sale data, where we know if it's a salvage sale or, or how much wood uh, may have blown down in that in that windstorm or that area that's been uh, killed by beetles. Uh, we can use that information to tell us something about economics uh, and tell us something about how we might respond um, to the importance of uh, making these forests recover after after the disturbance. So as uh, beginning to wrap up, um, uh, summary, primary disturbances, it's about 400,000 acres of uh, Minnesota's forest annually um, that are disturbed by something. Uh, as we indicated, animal and weather damage seem to be kind of the primary agents uh, that are disturbing our forest. And then a note on the, on the data, um, just use caution when interpreting something that's very broad, uh, very kind of coarse level data uh, to understand really localized things that might be um, in your woods or in woods that you work in, uh, to really understand the data, kind of know the differences between, you know, what does the aerial survey data have? What are the limitations of it? What might FIA data have? What might uh, agency data have that, that you collect? Um, what kind of uh, limitations and advantages uh, might these various sources of data have um, um, an understanding for disturbance attributes? And then obviously this is uh, kind of a, a call for the forest managers and silviculturists uh, that might be watching, but um, consider emulating natural disturbance and uh, forest management and think about ways to promote forest health um, as a part of, of, of the landscape. And I'll kind of leave you with uh, kind of the same figure, just looking at uh, very broad trends in, in forest health um, as a snapshot of uh, kind of where we are today, at least what's been impacting our forest these last five years. And I believe we have plenty of time for questions if we have some coming in. I don't see any. You want to check and make sure that we directly. Yeah, I don't see any either. I do see, um, yeah, Eli mentioned the, the EAB webinar um, that we did in May. Kind of learning from Michigan. Any new questions on that? Kind of, what, what can we learn from Michigan and Minnesota that can help us to prepare for that? So, really encourage folks to take a look at that webinar uh, and also the Eastern Large Beetle webinar that Brian Offman gave um, earlier this year at some point. I don't remember the month on that. April. Uh, Matt, uh, we do have a question here from Cloquet. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, uh, I think when, when Mac was up, we may have misheard, but we thought that we heard him say that harvesting was not included under human disturbances in FIA data. But then when we saw the distribution of human disturbance across the landscape, it sure seemed to mirror where the forest is. So we're wondering, did we mishear that? Is harvesting counted by FIA in, in human disturbance, or did we... Uh, uh, can, can you just clarify that for us, please? Thank you. Yeah, Mac, do you want to answer that? The mic should be able to pick you up. From yeah, way. harvesting is not included in human disturbances. Human disturbance is any activity other than um, what would be called a treatment, which is maybe timber harvesting and silviculture prescriptions. Yeah, and, and so I guess an example of a human disturbance would be clearing shooting lanes, kind of like that, that image that I had in St. Louis County. Um, so not necessarily a forest management treatment, 
um, but human damage other than forest management. Question. Um, so as someone who deals with forest health, what do you think is the biggest issue? Because I feel like one of the issues might be like I'm reporting, like if I have an ash that dies in my yard and I cut it down to whatever, maybe you didn't know that emerald ash borer was up there. Yeah. Or do you think it's like educating landowners and like private landowners about all this stuff? Because I mean, if you own like commercial land, I feel like you probably, you know, understand some of this stuff. But like residential people probably don't know a lot about these like pending issues. Like I was talking to my sister yesterday and she had no idea what emerald ash borer was. So I don't know what the toughest issue is with all this forest health stuff. Yeah, I think I, I guess there's kind of two, maybe I have two answers to that question. The first is, you know, what are the major issues? Um, and certainly I think, yeah, there's animal and weather damage. Those are kind of always a part of our landscape. Um, but I really think there are a lot of other issues. You know, I think of something like our malaria, or something like the Plodia red pine. Um, that we think that they're very abundant, but they're just not kind of in this outbreak stage yet. Um, and so if, in a certain conditions, you know, a few years of drought that can kind of bring about um, very large increases in our malaria um, or something similar to that. So I think it's really these kind of um, forest health things that are happening that we don't even see that are very hard to identify. The Plodia is kind of hard to identify. You gotta look at clones and it's difficult. So I think. I think it's going to kind of be these uh, issues that are kind of lurking that we're not always seeing that might be a, a play a big role in the future. Um, and the second part of that question is kind of more related to outreach. Um, I think it because we're in Minnesota uh, and we're learning from some of the other states um, and places like Duluth or Big Forest, I think it's really important to be on the front lines of um, pests that we haven't seen yet. Um, so I think of um, things like walnut twig beetle and um, thousand cankers disease and Asian longhorn beetle. Um, we have some great programs and extension that um, help to identify those things. And even though it's not here in Minnesota, we can train volunteers, uh, people that are already out in the woods or are a part of urban tree care companies that are that are looking for these things. If we can prepare folks for things that aren't here yet but know how to look for them, uh, that I think can save us a lot of money in the long run. Other questions? Um, uh, Matt, this is Eli. I uh, received a private comment here that I'll pass along. Uh, the comment is, I would think that the removed trees on a shooting lane in FIA would actually not be counted uh, in FIA as human damage because damage is not collected on those trees removed. Just wonder if you or Mac have any thoughts on that. Yeah, Mac, what's the definition again of a disturbance that is human caused damage or mortality that's not a treatment, which is the treatment of harvesting or some so called prescription. So, sort of a vague definition. Yeah, and the definition, I believe, is 40% of the total plot area that it, has to be affected. It's, uh, it, it's uh, area one acre in size or larger in which 25% of the trees on the plot are damaged or killed. So, yeah, that's a great point about, you know, something like shooting lanes. But, yeah, I think, you know, small events, you know, that don't kind of meet that uh, FIA disturbance definition. Like, yeah, likely would not be counted, but um, with the FIA disturbances, they really need to be kind of large scale. You need to kind of be able to see them. In the Any other questions? Yeah, I see another comment about uh, shooting lanes as uh, a damage agent. I think we, we adjust that comment. Well, uh, without hearing anything else, um, I guess uh, Emily mentioned the webinar next month. Yeah, on the 16th. Can you say that again, the date and time? Yeah, August 16th at noon, we'll be meeting, um, and Bill Anderson from the Department of Forest Resources will discuss the natural resources applications of unmanned aerial photography.
Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'll remember too uh, in the follow-up email to send some of these links for some of these data sets and forest health reports that I mentioned today. Uh, those will be a part of the, the email as well. Um, so with that, uh, we'll sign off now and, and thanks everybody for joining.